So, uh, hello and welcome to this uh, next installment in our interview series. And today I'm sitting down with Kathleen Jennings. So, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, for Kathleen, me. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's off to a good start, I can tell. You paused and I said thank you. I'll be quiet until you ask me a direct question. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's fine. That's that's Zoom for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kathleen Jennings is an illustrator and artist and writer based in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, she has won a One World Fantasy Award as an illustrator, has been shortlisted once for the Yugos, for the Locus Awards, and has won a number of Ditma Awards as well. Her Australian Gothic debut, Fly Away, was published by Tor.com and Picador in 2020, and is among the works that we'll be talking about today. Um, and as far as I understand, she grew up at, on a small cattle station in Western Queensland in the landscape, landscape quite like the one that we can read about in Flyaway. Um, and she has also completed an MPhil on the topic of the visual evocation of the beautiful sublime in Australian Gothic literature. So that's very, very interesting for all of us, I think. <laughs> and uh, I think you're doing a PhD now, is that right? Correct, in jurisprudence in fantastic story worlds. Oh, wow. That sounds like such an interesting topic. I'm I have a colleague who does law and, and literature, so uh, maybe Lovely. you have something to talk about. <laughs> yes, I'll ask you more afterwards. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, shall we get started with the first question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So would you label your own writing specifically as Australian speculative fiction and why yes or why not? I think it depends on the individual piece of writing. Taken as a body of work, I would say yes, it's Australian speculative fiction because I'm an Australian person writing speculative fiction <laughs> and a lot of it is, a lot of it's deliberately affected by the landscape and the history. Some of it is affected in ways that I probably can't see even the stories which are set very much in a European inflected fantasy historical world. Uh, I'm very aware it's a particular view you get of that world when you grow up reading fairy tales in Western Queensland without a lot of the context around it. And also I'm very much a part of the Australian speculative fiction scene. So I'm quite pleased to be part of that. So yes, that's why. <laughs> Lovely. Yes, we've heard a lot about the uh, Australian speculative fiction scene in our previous interviews. Apparently, uh, a lot of you just know each other, so that's lovely. <laughs> it's a small country. <laughs> <laughs> well, from a German perspective, not so much. But... It's a small population. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds more accurate. Um, did you see any difference from other speculative fiction in English? I mean, I'm guessing you're reading other speculative fiction as well. So did you notice anything? To a degree, not consistently, I think, and possibly less so now. I feel like with, with the internet, with social media, there's a lot more conversation and people are often addressing the same problems or concerns, sometimes from different backgrounds. But, and, and I think that's great. And I like it. I do, I used to, get this feeling going back a decade or two at least English fantasy was very much old myths seeping up out of the ground and a lot of English fantasy and English horror and folk horror still is and the German fantasy that I read tended to be somewhat more I know there was always this philosophical vein running through it and American high fantasy was all under the greenwood tree merry bands of people and Australians are just like either doing that or vast spaces and drought <laughs> in a fantasy world. <laughs> so they used to just be these, and it's probably just the books that I was picking up, but there were these certain aesthetics almost running through. And I feel like that's a little bit less there now, but there are a lot of Australian speculative fiction writers who you can see, I think a lot of their awareness of the natural world and concerns around that are tied to geography here and to Australia as belonging to part of that sort of Asia, Australasia 
mm. area. And so there's a sense of the living world beyond people, which is also quite particular to the geography, but it's not always terribly obvious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, you, you made me curious now, uh, what kind of German fantasy novels did you read? <laughs> Not as many as I'd like to because my German is variable. <laughs> so I tended to read, to be honest, I did a lot of the reading I have done in German was reading books I already knew quite well in English because it was easier to read them without a dictionary if I knew where the story was going. Uh, I read, uh, I adored Momo <laughs> and um, I'd, I'd quite like to get back into reading some more, again, audiobooks, but uh, I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of picture books and some comics at various points in time but it has been a little while mm -hmm. well uh remind me to give you some recommendations later <laughs> please do i'd like that <laughs> <laughs> um well speaking of recommendations that leads me very well to the next question and it wasn't planned at all <laughs> since australian speculative fiction is not that well known internationally or if it is then the australian part sometimes just gets ignored with Garth Nix, for example. He's, he's seen as a fantasy writer and that's it. And you never really know that he's Australian. But do you have any favorites or recommendations for us? I suppose it's always like, if you had a specific, like, I like this book, what's, what's to my taste by Australians? So <laughs> I do feel like I'm going to be leaving out a lot of my friends, <laughs> favorite <laughs> authors are going generally. So there's some people who are doing some really lovely stuff in the fields that I particularly like. So there's amazing authors out there. Uh, Angela Slater, I work with a lot. Uh, she does a lot. She does um, a lot of horror and gothic and dark urban fantasy. But her most lovely work, I think, is some very uh, fairy tale tinged mosaic novels. Sourdough, Bitterwood and The Tallow Wife, which is the third collection of interconnected stories is coming out this year. She also has a novel coming out um, called All the Murmuring Bones, a lot of short stories. So I, I really like her work and she mentors a lot of Australian writers as well. So she's sort of a good person. If you're following her online, you'll also get a lot of recommendations there. In the more gothic space, I think Trent Jamison is doing some interesting work. He has a lovely, it's not his most recent book, but a lovely one called Dayboy, which is kind of sort of a post-apocalyptic post -apocalyptic vampire novel, but it also feels like a late 18th, early 19th century novel of, I don't know, of a world unmaking itself. I really, really liked that. So there are a lot of great authors out there. It's always worth keeping an eye on what, The national awards are, I suppose, to get an idea mm -hmm. of what people are appreciating. So the Ditmars and the Orialis Awards in Australia for science fiction and fantasy fairly generally. And then there's a couple more specific award categories are great. And uh, I'm just thinking, so once I start naming people, I want to name everybody. <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of like really interesting works being done in different fields. I suppose the Brisbane people, are, after the last year that we've had, the Brisbane people are the ones I've been seeing and talking to on a more day-to-day -day basis. I wonder why that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sean Tan is another one, most known for his picture books, but he also writes short fiction, often illustrated, and really lovely work. And a very interesting writer from the, and illustrator from the point of view of Australian fantasy because he's seen as, as I said, a picture book writer and to the extent he writes as slightly more literary and even that fine art and picture books. And he goes, he's very much embedded in Australian speculative fiction. His first artworks were for one of, one of the Australian genre magazines. <laughs> and so it's, he's one of the people who's been doing really interesting things coming out of that. Uh, someone else I've worked with directly is Margot, Lan Margot Lanigan and it's some wonderful work and she plays a lot in the literary space as well as horror and fairy tales so I really enjoy working with her. Yeah just there's quite a few people there but I think the awards shortlists are probably the place to go to really see what's coming out recently. Because right. often there are works in there, you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know they were Australian. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been looking to the awards quite a lot to find material for a project. And once you look into it, there's so much more than, than you'd expect. I, I know yes. I did a course like a couple of years ago on Australian fantasy and I'd only just started looking into it. So I didn't find that much. And now that I've been researching it in detail, is there's such a lot of variety, such a range. So I'm yes. really happy to be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I think award, award shortlists and then judges panels after awards are fabulous. I judged the, I was one of the judges for the World Fantasy Awards a couple of years ago. It was an amazing experience and I'd quite like to do it at, in a year or two after I finish my PhD for mm -hmm. some of the Australian awards because just getting to benchmark across a field in mm -hmm. a year is fabulous. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Um, I actually forgot one question that sort of ties back into the first one, which is, um, since you describe your writing as Australian speculative fiction, what, what about your art? Is that particularly Australian as well, or is that more universal? It is probably, hmm, I want to say it's Australian for the same reasons I said my writing is, but probably less consciously and less obviously. Mm. So I have, I love the visual vocabulary of fairy tales. And I hadn't seen a lot of that using Australian imagery in a way that I liked or that felt to me the way a lot of the other picture books and so forth I was reading um, were. There are a lot more authors doing that. Sean Tan has, is a revelation and he uses inspiration from so many different fields and aspects of art and from Australian art history. So there are definitely people who are doing that. And what I've been doing with some of, with the illustrations for Flyaway and with some pieces I've been doing for Corella Press, which is a university teaching press reprinting some 19th century stories. Oh. It's just trying to give that, that sense of it being Australian without it being kangaroos everywhere and <laughs> Forex beer and everything else. Nothing against Forex beer, but, just, but yeah, just a particular a particular, I think there's learned and received ways of looking at particular cultures and landscapes and stories. And I've been working my way around how I want to deal with Australia in that sense. And there's a few pieces I've done that I'm happy with and I feel are both me and very tailish and very Australian. Uh, but it's an ongoing process. So I hope it is a little more universal. I think art is potentially more universal than the written language, mm -hmm. but not utterly universal. Mm -hmm. Just because something's drawn doesn't mean it makes sense in every culture or time or era. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. I mean, I, I like drawing, so uh, that's, that's an aspect of your work that I really love the most. Not, I mean, I love your writing as well, but because I draw as well, uh, I was drawn to your sketch, drawn to your sketchbooks. <laughs> I really like looking at them on your web page. So, thank you. People listening, do check out uh, Kathleen Jennings' uh, artistic work. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so, where do you draw your inspiration from? Um, what other pieces of writing or which other artists, visual artists, inspire you? I do actively try to draw inspiration from everywhere and it's something I, I kind of make a game of it. it. Even if it's something I hate or don't understand, what can I steal from this? What can I, what can I turn it into? What could I make it? So there's games of you know going to the art gallery and looking at, I went with a friend once and we're like, okay, we're at the art gallery and we are going to pretend that every piece in this art gallery is a response to the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. And it was great because we'd stand there in front of paintings where you wouldn't usually have time for. And we're like, well, I think something about the light in the background, it sort of like feels like a you know, procession from darkness to light. And, <laughs> and, we, and eventually you get to one painting and you're like, hmm, they're standing there going, oh, no, no, this one actually is an Orpheus and Eurydice. <laughs> Or listening to music if it's if it's on the radio in the car and it's not music I'm familiar with pretending it's over the end credits for a movie and trying to work backwards and work out what the movie would be so all these ways of drawing inspiration from and and liking things and I do try to bring all that in because I enjoy I enjoy the enlivening effect and the fun of 
trying to grab everything and make it serve my purposes. And I don't want to just be locked into just doing the same drawing, the same story, the same way over and over. At the same time, I love looking at pictures and like talking in workshops to people going, there's nothing like cliches are cliches for a reason. It's not just <laughs> habit. Like if you think of your first visual image for Cinderella, for me, it's like Cinderella running down the stairs, the shoe on the stair, the dress held out, the clock, the prince in the doorway distantly. And it's a, it's a key scene that a lot of illustrators do for a reason, but what can you bring in from elsewhere and, and do something new with it? Like, how do you keep all the strengths of that, but make it your own? So what I tend to respond to most easily, I suppose, is in terms of visuals, is the visuals of old fairy tale illustrations, golden age illustrations and illustrators who are working in that field. What I've found really interesting is that that would suggest that I'm very much a arts and crafts movement, William Morris and Art Nouveau sort of person. And I love that. And I probably draw it more easily, but I tend to gravitate a little bit more to Art Deco and the sort of the sort of vibrant, snappy, almost a visual shorthand, but still quite romantic in some ways. So I really like that. Uh, as I said, uh, a lot of the artists playing with fairy tale illustrations, but also I'm just looking at my, at my art library over here. A lot of early mid-century advertising illustration, magazine illustration. I just, I really enjoy it. And I love the work which, in which the people seem to have either they feel like miniatures from an illuminated manuscript who have come alive and are running around doing things, or they feel like humans who have fallen into a magical world. So I always get the pronunciation wrong. Alphonse Mucha, <laughs> his <laughs> Mucha, I don't know. I don't, I don't That's know. embarrassing. I always see it written down. <laughs> Those beautiful pictures of the women, like sort of framed by with the frame and the circles and the flowers. When you see people drawing in that style, they tend to keep the geometries and the frames and the people in them become very idealized and cartoonized and mm. slim and beautiful. You look at the actual women in those paintings and they're weighty, they're like fully formed. They look like real people. Uh, they have a, you know, a weight on and in the, in the world and mm. they're affecting it and being affected by it. I love that some of the particular artists and writers who I think I first loved, fairy tales generally, particularly Little Red Riding Hood, and then The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, and then The Chronicles of Pride Aim by Lord Alexander, and then Tolkien, though funnily enough, I love Lord of the Rings, but my favorite Tolkien book, and I'm going to turn off my background here so I can show you. <laughs> no. Uh, my favourite Tolkien book is actually um, Farmer Giles of Ham, <laughs> which is illustrated. Oh, mm. It's one about the, the dragon and the dog that speaks bad dog Latin. <laughs> <laughs> but it's illustrated by Pauline Baines, who illustrated the Chronicles of Narnia, and she was the first illustrator I really recognised as an illustrator. Mm. And much as I adore the Narnia illustrations, and it's one of the books I never read in German because I picked up a copy of the... Uh, Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe, and it was illustrated by a different illustrator. It's like, well, it's not the same book. <laughs> and I wish I had, I wish I had bought it. <laughs> but that was early on. Uh, and I really love what she's doing here with the style inspired by, but not strictly from manuscripts. Mm. So, yeah, that one. Looks like a beautiful copy. <laughs> It is lovely. And again, it's one that often is illustrated. Like if someone offered me the chance to illustrate it, I'd take it. <laughs> but I still feel rather bitter whenever I pick it up illustrated by someone else. I'm like, well, it's not Pauline Baines, it doesn't count. <laughs> so they're probably the biggest immediate illustrations, uh, biggest immediate impact. Mm. There's a lot of other illustrators who I could name have had a big impact on me. Often later on, Edward Ardizzoni is someone I only started to recognise when I already was starting to have a career I just hadn't been exposed to his work a lot I love the sketchy ink style of a lot of mid-century 
and early 20th century picture of uh, children's novel illustrations of I don't know who was illustrating a lot of the Inez books but I really like really liked those mm. and there's something about the sense of the realism and a realistic approach to how people act but also you could see all the ink lines and I loved that <laughs> I can think of others <laughs> <laughs> There's a book, and I'm going to oh, Ella, Ella, Evelyn Evelyn Ness. Can't believe I've forgotten her name. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful illustrator, and very like cutouts and graphics and rubbings of textures. And particularly one of her books called "Do You Have the Time, Lydia," which I have an old ex-library copy of it, which was shelved under Time Management for Children's, <laughs> and the life of that. I really loved. Did that answer the question? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking of talking, I just yesterday, I think I read uh, an interview with you in the Locus magazine about the talking art exhibition in Oxford yes. in 2018. And I was really happy to read that you'd been to that because I've been there too. <laughs> maybe maybe we saw each other. I don't know. <laughs> quite possibly <laughs> which days it was fascinating it was amazing but as I think I said in there I walked around a corner and saw some of Pauline Bain's original painted maps of Middle Earth and started having hysterics <laughs> and my actually my my PhD advisor was there with her and she's like we're here to see Tolkien's art and I'm like I know and I'm excited about that but I was expecting to see Tolkien's art like I came all this way to see Tolkien's art I wasn't prepared to see Pauline Bain's <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful experience. <laughs> I think yeah. something I loved about that exhibition too was how much you could see of Tolkien as a writer who just used images as a way of making notes to himself and Tolkien who, as an illustrator who just used it as a way to communicate with his children and Tolkien as an illustrator more seriously, but then all the letters from other people and writers and young Terry Pratchett writing to him and that sense of community and one of my favorite I can't believe I didn't mention this when I was answering that question one of my very favorite writers is Diana Wynne Jones I love her work um, mm -hmm. How's Moving Castle Deep Secret oh, yes. amazing amazing writer and I think I assess a lot of people against what she's doing and she is very much using myth and fairy tale in the way that Talking to an extent, Lewis definitely, Francis Harding now, all use. And I um, can't remember where I was going with that, but it was relevant. <laughs> um, I don't know where you were going with it, but... Uh, I I'm... think just that sense of people being influenced by other people. Yeah, that, that makes sense. <laughs> Which reminded me of something I did want to say about being an Australian writer and illustrator and what makes it Australian SF. Going over seriously to Germany, the, Germany first, and then also to England and uh, Norway and Iceland and getting to see those places is amazing when you've grown up on fairy tales in Australia because they all feel like universal stories and then you go somewhere like the Black Forest or the particular village in Iceland where something actually happened or Dartmoor and it's Hound of the Baskervilles territory you're like, oh, this is a really specific story. <laughs> I didn't realize it was a story about one person in one actual place doing a thing rather than just something universal. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite interesting approaching stories like that as an Australian. Yeah, that, that sounds really interesting. I wonder how my perspective on the Australian books I've been reading would change, will change if I hopefully get to Australia once we can travel again. <laughs> One of oh. the amazing things about travel and landscape was feeling what the weight of stories feels like on a landscape and going to Iceland and you've got like 1200 years of European history and a couple of Irish monks before that you're like oh and I got home I was like oh this is what 50,000 years of stories feels like on a landscape <laughs> um where am I oh yes uh well parts of this you've already answered I think but um 
where's, where do you see the role of, of illustration and visual art when it comes to speculative fiction? Because you, you illustrate your own work, but also other people's work. So um, what's your perspective on that? I think it should be to make beautiful books. <laughs> that said, I always resist decorative, like purely decorative illustration. It was always something I'm like, I love, I love purely decorative illustration, mm -hmm. but it wasn't personally something that I wanted to do. I wanted chatty illustrations. I wanted movement. I wanted a sense of talking back and forth with the text. And then when I did my own, illustrated my own work, I suddenly got stuck because, excuse me, a lot of what I wanted to say, including the visuals, was in the text. And because I was telling the story with the text first, I was wanting to create visual effects, which I don't do. I'm not a painterly illustrator. And I wanted to get certain light and color effects in the story that were drawn from like Tom Roberts paintings or a specific work of art. And I couldn't do that in my own work, but also all the story was already in the words. And to an extent, a lot of my academic inclinations go into illustrating because it's a way to comment on and draw bits out of the story mm. and do interesting things with it and hold it up. And I had to write an exegetical essay about my own work. So, so that urge was taken and I ended up using the illustration a lot more in Flyaway to to ornament to an extent, but also just to anchor the feeling of the world to say, this is Gothic, this is fairy tale, this is, but I want to be able to see these elements, which are horrific in some ways as also beautiful and potentially ornamental. So that's my illustration theory <laughs> more generally in philosophy. In speculative fiction, particularly, the vast majority of what you see is on book covers. And in that case, mm -hmm. it really is to, and not purely in a cynical sense, but it is to sell the book. It is to tell, and it is to communicate with readers to say, this is a book you'll want to read. And that's very important. I personally think that the, the typography is more important than the art. <laughs> like, <laughs> anything can save bad art. Nothing can save bad lettering. <laughs> <laughs> but I would love to see more inside. And something I think that art on the outside of a book and on the inside does is also tell people not only is this the sort of book that you want to read but this is a book that enough people cared about to spend mm. the time to put art into it it can also make it more of a, a beautiful object and I think the ebook age has freed up the print books to be objects in certain ways uh, and also modern printing techniques are getting like cheaper and more flexible so you can do fun things with with foil and stuff like that I love reading about I love reading old memoirs and instructional books from earlier in publishing history because just to see how the techniques have changed mm -hmm. or how if you wanted to print Garth Williams uh, beautiful graphite drawings you had to sacrifice some of the print quality of the words of the actual mm -hmm. text of the book because of the different printing processes that you had to use so I'm really interested in all of that but we're so freed up by it now I know cost is an object, but it is lovely seeing books that have a hint of amusement or a second voice or just an appreciation of them or an elevation of what you're reading. And I think I like looking at it. I'd like to see more of it. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely agree with you. I'd, I'd love to see more novels for adults as well that are being illustrated. And I think it's, it's happening slowly. It is. It's so lovely to see. And there's a lot in YA. Often mm. the collectible or the limited edition or the big names in YA, YA but there is a lot of art, even mm. if it's just ornamental chapter headers, which I've been doing quite a few of lately. And I hope that that seeps across from, given that so many adults read YA, <laughs> they'll come to demand it in other, <laughs> other areas. <laughs> yes, I hope so too. So it's a I mean, there's, there's lots of people who would love to see it and lots of people who would love to do it, I'm sure. And one of my favourite approaches is just being given a manuscript and turned loose on it and I sketch my way through and then someone takes the raw scans and puts it in the book, which is how <laughs> I worked with Angela Slater's um, Tallow Wife and Bitterwood Bible. And I, I love doing that. I love that reaction. But I also remember reading, we had a big edition of James Harriet's All Creatures Great and Small, his stories of being a vet in Yorkshire in the uh, 40s and 50s and I remember down the side of each page there were these little diagrams of just farming equipment, vet equipment, local objects, gates and things like that 
and I just I really liked that sense of the texture of a world. Yeah, that sounds like a lovely uh, illustration for that book. Um, well, uh, approaching other people's or illustrating other people's arts on your portfolio, you have a number of maps. And so that's, that's something really interesting to me, because, of course, talking about speculative fiction, there's maps everywhere. And we talk about maps in our course as well. So what do you think about it? How do you approach maps when you're illustrating? I, think, I love the sheer variety of things that maps can do and that you can do with maps. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the book, The, White, the Writer's Map by Hugh Lewis-Jones. Uh, it's really, so, but... it's gorgeous. It's maps from books with essays by different writers. So it's got mm -hmm. like maps from Peter Pan. It's got maps from C.S. Lewis. It's got maps from more modern works. It's great. Beautiful, beautiful book. <laughs> Highly recommend it. <laughs> uh, but I think growing up on the land and with a father who was an army officer and liked to attempt to teach us to read maps <laughs> and also reconstruct three-dimensional versions of maps to start with. And then I just think I had a chance of the people I was around. There's a few Australian authors who are really into maps and getting to go to lectures given by them was fascinating. I'm just I'm going to blank on the name. <laughs> Unfortunately, across the face of the across the face of the world, Russell Kirkpatrick. <laughs> and I remember him because he, he was he's a cartographer and he worked mm -hmm. making atlases. And he gave a fabulous lecture on some of the things maps did, showing a bit of an area of a map of New Zealand and trying saying, okay, can you see what these numbers are next to the bridges? What are they? It was weight loads so that oh. because it was an army map, so if if the army needed to like go across them, they would know, but it probably wasn't that relevant on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Maps of safety, maps, you know, people were <laughs> people would arrive and take over someone else's country and go draw us a map of where everything is. And they'd be presented with a map that looks like there's a road down the middle, but it might be, it might not be a road for people to actually travel on. It represented some other aspect of life. Uh, just all of those potentials, even just drawing a, a mud map or a sketch map of where you're going and the way that enlarges mm -hmm. and expands. It's always fun to try and draw a map of your own country from memory if you're a few years out of primary school. <laughs> <laughs> and just what that communicates so I've always been interested in the potential and oh the other map I think is the map that they're given in the voyage of the dawn treader with all the little people moving about in if you if you looked really close in at the pictures of the cities <laughs> and I think that's the sort of map that I loved the idea of most I I'm not a person who likes to solve puzzles in books. I prefer to watch detectives solve them. I do not have any interest in working out exactly how long it will take you to get from A to B. To me, a map is a feeling of the world and a promise of the world and rewards closer looking with stories. So I always have to be very clear to people when I'm teaching a workshop on illustrating maps or they're asking me to illustrate a map, which is to say, I'm not a cartographer and I'm not a geographer. I think as from my perspective, there are two things I need to know in relation to those. One is everything is connected. The other is water flows downhill unless it has extreme provocation to the contrary. <laughs> Beyond that, what I'm interested in is just giving a sense of, a sense of almost an aerial view of a world that you can then parachute into and land and be absorbed by and go wandering off in. And it is quite, it, the result is a work that's quite ornamental or decorative, but I want it to be made up of stories and reactions. And if I'm going to fill in a blank space, then I'll put a strange little animal doing something there. And with luck in the sequel, the author might incorporate that into the story. <laughs> so yeah, for me, that's what maps mm -hmm. are. It's a promise of a certain sort of book. It's a promise of a particular type of world. And I am fascinated by books which have like beautiful maps I'm trying to remember the oh I'm gonna forget I forget the name of the book it's a middle grade nothing I'm about to say is going to make it Henry <laughs> Lien Henry Lien's book the amazing he's not Australian Henry Lien 
wrote a book called Pearl, no, Peace Sprout Chen, Future Legend of Skate and Sword, <laughs> which is, it isn't not fantasy, but it's about a girl who's, uh, yeah, goes to a special academy for this combined skating and sword work martial art where all the surfaces are made of stuff that you can skate on. And the map at the beginning of it is delightful because it's a map of the school, but it's all the skating tracks. And there's this beautiful little, beautiful little drawings of all the main buildings. It was gorgeous. And then the, um... <laughs> this is terrible. I just keep blanking on the names of books. Uh, traitor. Something, the something traitor books. Oh gosh, it's embarrassing. But the maps in those books are annotated. I it was one of those situations where I ended up reading the second book without reading the first, and I loved it because <laughs> the map had clearly been annotated in the interval between the books by the main character. Which is sort of <laughs> this is a terrible place. <laughs> Don't go here. If you go to this location, make sure you eat this. <laughs> And um, yeah, I, I need to start actually keeping my own little set of books and then classic, classic again, somewhat mid-century-ish children's book map illustrations, I find beautiful. So yes, the ones in Narnia, but more so the ones in books like The Little White Horse by Elizabeth Goodge and mm -hmm. uh, yes, You've inspired me. I'm going to go away and I'm going to start a list with the artists' names next to them so that I can <laughs> the right people. But they are often, a, there's a sense in those maps of you can see individual trees which have mm. personalities. Um, the Moomin books, those maps have delightful, like there's this sense. And I think there's an essay in the writer's map about those maps. And there's a sense of, yes, there's itinerant characters in those books, but on the map, they are shown in a particular location, not because they're always there, but because it's the sort of person, it's the sort of place where you might encounter that sort of person. Ooh. And I love that potential for a map, not this is what you will find here, but this is what you might see here. This is a place that is conducive to this. Sounds great. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was a great answer. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So uh, this is no surprise then that maps feature so much in your short story, The Tangled Streets, since you're yes. so fascinated by them. Um, so why why are the power of maps in world making and why make it take place in a city? Because if we think maps, especially in speculative fiction, we often think like large worlds, a continent, and not so often we think about cities so do tell us a bit more about that that one came I can think of two very precise inspirations for that one I, I remember the experience I was staying in Sydney I was staying at a youth hostel in King's Cross and I was I can't remember why I was there I must have had a reason I have family in Sydney so clearly I had a reason for staying at a youth hostel in King's Cross it was great I was sketching at a cafe across the road every morning and they kept saying will you draw us a mural and I said no every day. And then one day they're like, here, here are some permanent markers. Please draw on our wall. And I was like, can I have free breakfast until I leave? <laughs> it was great. But then I'd go wandering around parts of Sydney, the old inner areas of Sydney. And I, it was a breezy, cool day on the edge of winter, and which is a very different climate, <laughs> very different season here. So it was sunny and bright and there are a few dry leaves, there's still flowers, but not as many as you get in Brisbane. And just the sense of possibility and these old houses and new houses and you could see Sydney centre through some of the buildings as you mm. went up on the hills. Found this amazing checkered cape at a secondhand shop. But unfortunately, while I like to think it would make me look like Little Red Riding Hood, it just makes me look like a travelling picnic. <laughs> I don't do well in checks but it was just this this real sense of enchantment I was walking around I had a book in my pocket I was handwriting in cafes which I should do more of uh, I'm always in cafes but I should do more handwriting <laughs> and just this sense of someone walking through this place who wasn't quite from there who wasn't unfamiliar with it the way I'm not unfamiliar with Sydney but I'm not from there mm. and then there's a, an older Australian I guess you'd call it YA now 
kids' fantasy called Playing BT Bo, which mm-hmm. is a time slip fantasy of a girl who slips back through into the 19th century. And there's an image in that where she's in old Sydney. And I might be re- remembering it wrong because it has been a few years since I read it. She's in old Sydney at, in the rocks and she looks across and she can see the lights of the Sydney Harbour Bridge which was built, I think, in the 1930s, and just that sense of seeing across times. And then playing Beatty Bow was the first book I ever read where I then got to go to the place for the first time and and see it. And I like when I get to New York or something, I'm like, it's not fair. People in New York must feel like this all the time. But for me, going to Sydney, going to the Rocks District in Sydney, seeing specific places that were mentioned in this book, it was the first time I'd ever had that experience when I was small. So being in Sydney with that backstory of how Sydney is to me in stories just started that sense of someone wandering and getting slightly lost. I think the the big fancy gates she sees in the story mm. were very much, uh, that was a pair of gates. I wandered down a side street and saw those gates and the way the light fell just felt like it belonged. And I liked the idea of someone sort of falling through between times in a way and then not quite being able to get out again and having to resort to drastic measures which is something that comes up in a lot of my stories to varying extents so in that case I'm really glad that you read that one because it's a little harder to get hold of at the moment I'm hoping to change that in the future but I I'm still quite fond of it (laughs) I enjoyed it um (laughs) I've we've we've uh started and and we're constantly bothering our librarian to get <laughs> more books from Australia and specifically speculative fiction. So the anthology that it's in Bloodlines is, was one of those books that we had her get. So. Actually, uh, a friend in Brisbane, Peter Ball, has started a small press called Brain Jar Press, and he's doing a lot of reprints of people's anthologies and collections, mm. as well as bringing out some new novellas and works by a lot of Australian writers. So worth keeping an eye on in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. That's right. (laughs) But I think something that fascinates me about cities too is for me, cities are, I know, I feel I go overseas. It's like there's a city and then it kind of ends and there's some landscape and then there's another city (laughs) in Australia. Like you had to drive six hours to get to the city and the city as this sort of separate item and that you could draw on a map in one place and then have lands in between it. And it's something I still love. I started watching Still Star-Crossed which is a TV series continuing, like what happens after Romeo and Juliet. I have only seen the first episode several times. I cannot speak to its quality, (laughs) but it captured that sense of the city state or the walled city and a Mm. story that could happen in a place that you could see all at once. And I've done a lot of drawings and written a little bit about, like, I love the sense too of a stand of trees that you can see around. You'll see that little grove of trees in the middle of a park. You're like, that could be its own world. What if, it's only 10 or 11 trees, but you could walk into it and get lost. And I like that idea with the city as well, that it's its its own standalone thing, but it's bigger on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like you're setting up the next question. <laughs> but before, before you ask me... Okay. Um, I was also going to say about Tangled Streets and, and then yes. with that, that love of maps and that sense of what if, what if you draw just, what if the map doesn't exist until you get there? Mm. There's a wonderful story um, out, out of suburbia by Sean Tan, which is sort of like, what do you, what happens at the edge of the street map? This is sort of the opposite of that. What happens if you have to draw the map yourself? Yeah, and that's, you that's really, uh, fascinating concept because you're literally making the world as you go along and that I think that relates so much to fantasy writing as well so it's really it great has, to be sorry, I was going to say it just has fascinating fascinating ramifications if you're talking about a country with a colonial history as well as far as coming in and overlaying a map on something which I definitely did not interrogate in that story which is perhaps something <laughs> but uh, it's certainly a fascinating question Mm. to play with as a writer yes I'm I'm glad you brought that colonial aspect uh, up as well because we're definitely going to make our students think about that (laughs) (laughs) Mm. in that context 
uh, Anna Tambor, some of her short stories, uh, they're amazing, but there's one called The Valley of the Sugars of Salt, which mm -hmm. is something that always springs to mind when I start thinking about some of those questions. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll check that out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so bigger on the inside. Uh, <laughs> This is a little bit of a fun question in the middle of the interview, just to, to get us to, well, maybe fangirl. Um, I'm a Hoovian. I suspect you are too. Yeah, a um, bit. <laughs> <laughs> I love your Dalek series. So tell us more about that. Thank you. Oh, I just, I just like Daleks. I don't know. I, there's something about their voices. They... <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like logic that has been pushed past the point of endurance and I think I've said in a few places they sound like panicked engineers <laughs> <laughs> they just I found that very charming and I also love one of you know I love changing a word in a thing I love the game of you know and I think it actually before the dialects it started with the ducks going um I love you flash but we have only 14 ducks to save the earth <laughs> and then <laughs> And then following a statement like that to its logical conclusion and then drawing a picture of it. So another one was, um, it was, it was the best of ducks. It was the worst of ducks. Oh no, it was a duck. It's a duck universally acknowledged. <laughs> what can I do with that? <laughs> and I, and I sort of side slipped into doing it with Daleks because they amused me so much and I loved them. And I'd tried, you know, a uni and now and then, played with the idea of doing a web comic but I I don't tend to think that particular way for long periods of time but with the Daleks because they were one-off they were spot illustrations I could do a bunch or I could not do it for ages they amused me <laughs> and I was drawing them because I'm like huh just throw the name Dalek into a book title and see what falls out <laughs> and yeah it just it was fun it was sketchy I got to use pen and ink in a really Again, like I said, almost a chatty way, mm -hmm. even though I'm using a dip pen that I have to dip nib in the ink, uh, which isn't the easiest or most fluid of mediums always. <laughs> <laughs> and people, people responded to it, I think, which is as a writer, as an illustrator, often sometimes you write for yourself and sometimes you write for other people, mm -hmm. or sometimes to annoy them. <laughs> sometimes I'll make choices in a story I'll get to a point I'm like mm, I could do this which I would personally enjoy or I could do this which I know will really annoy my friends <laughs> <laughs> so which do I choose <laughs> that's um, what friends are for <laughs> yeah just that that getting a response is quite fun it's one of the many reasons to do this and yeah I know it was fun it was a way to connect with people it's mm -hmm. it's quite a fun fact to pull out I, I still I still do it not hugely regularly but I try and do at least one a month for um at the moment I've just been showing them to uh, patrons on Patreon but I'm, I'm building up a little store so I can start again at some point if I want because it is it's is fun it's charming absolutely um what's, what's your favorite play, hmm? oh I was just gonna say it lets me play in so many people's in so many people's stories and go, I'm going to go a little bit Edward Gorey-esque in this. So this one's going to be a shout out to the Sandman, you know, uh, comic. So this one, yeah, this one's for Inez, but <laughs> I can't remember. Did, have I done The Lion, the Witch and the Dalek? I must have. I can't imagine that. I, I think have. so. I think you did. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite Dalek drawing? Do you have one? Or? I do. <laughs> H.G. Wells, The Invisible Dalek. <laughs> <laughs> I left the page blank and I just wrote The Invisible Dalek. <laughs> <laughs> Only my favourite because I've done like 150 other ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, I, I mean, I have, I have a lot that amuse me, but I'm always particularly pleased with that one. It makes me laugh. Yeah, I'm... Um they're 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 huge fun to check out i don't think i've seen all of them because they're quite a lot by this point but i've seen a couple and i've shared them with friends who were also really <laughs> pleased you. with them so i love it when people realize it's their favorite book or i did the velveteen dalek in honor of yeah i think i did that one more recently 
<laughs> the wonderful Velveteen Dalek experience in a secondhand bookshop in London, <laughs> 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 which was that the bookseller, I, I was looking at a book illustrated by Pauline Baines that I didn't have yet. And it was a first edition. And I asked how much it was and I expected it to be out of my price range. And he gave me a price which was just out of my price range. So I'm like, oh, maybe I should get it to do the first edition. And then he's behind me sort of like, oh, gosh, I should probably just have checked. And so, so he went and looked it up and I could hear him making noises in the background. He's like, oh, <laughs> well, since I told you it was 60 pounds, you can have it for 60 pounds. But I think it's more in the 100, 200 pound <laughs> price range. And I was like, I was thinking about it. And I thought, I like it, but I'm not... I gather books to me, but I don't need a first edition. Um, and it is outside what I was wanting to pay, even if it mm. had been. And so I said, look, it's it's okay. I, I won't get it. You can have it. And he was really happy. And he started bringing out his own like private collection of first editions to show me, I guess, because he knew they were safe from me. And he had a first edition of The Velveteen Rabbit. <laughs> so, and so as a result, a lot of the dialects are tied to particular memories. <laughs> <laughs> lovely um <laughs> i once got a first edition of a strand magazine with a sherlock holmes story in it for two pounds i was yeah that was interesting it was a it was like a a yard sale type thing and they had a lot of strand magazines and so i was going through them because oh strand magazine they might have a sherlock holmes and they did and so I asked the person doing the store, you know, how much is it? And he said, oh, you can have the, you know, all 20 of them for £10. And it's like, uh, well, I would take that, but tomorrow I'm flying back to Germany and I think Ryanair would kill me if I brought all these books. Um, and luckily, they, were, they weren't uh, chronological. So uh, I convinced them that it, I could buy just one of them because it wasn't the proper series. And he just went, oh, is, is, is two pounds, is that too much? He's like, no, that's, that's fine. I'm just, <laughs> bye, I'm going to Germany now. <laughs> He's doing that at shops. I'm like, here's a collection of theatre memorabilia for $10. I was like, I'm going to take out the beautiful unfolded gold printed theatre flyer for the original screenings of Camelot. I'm just going to give you back the rest. <laughs> fun times <laughs> book people should never plan to fly home <laughs> on a budget airline <laughs> fly there but like we've got to be honest we've got to start being honest with ourselves <laughs> oh yes I've, I've started going back and from London by train now <laughs> it's, not, it's not that bad from Germany it's fine I have to do it sometime <laughs> next time I'm over there <laughs> and then you can write another uh, volume of the travelogues yes I'm very keen to do it in uh, new, new countries <laughs> <laughs> well on German trains you'll have a lot of time to draw or to write <laughs> because they take ages so. <laughs> perfect as long as I'm not driving that's fine everyone's always like hire a car I was like first of all no <laughs> so traumatized by having to work out what the sixth gear was for in England and secondly like driving's only fun if someone gets the fun of looking out the windows that's true <laughs> <laughs> so I do, do try German trains you'll yeah. have a lot of time on them I will definitely try <laughs> <laughs> um, where was I oh yes uh different types of writing so you've written Fly Away is a novel, novella, uh, but you, you've also written a number of short stories and short comics. Um, so what's different when it comes to the writing process and, and how do you decide which way you want to tell a story? I, I tend to fairly early on get a feeling for whether a story wants to make itself felt in words or whether it's something that I want to show through lines. Like if there's particularly jaunty lines that I want to do, or I, I've been playing with some, practicing some comic techniques recently, and suddenly there's a little character, and I like her red dress, and you can't describe a red dress in every scene, but you can show it 
in a bunch of panels and you can do fun visual things with that. So I like that. Sometimes when I'm working out a story idea, I'll take notes in a combination of words and pictures and mm -hmm. sometimes it'll pull a little bit one way, but otherwise the pictures are often just a form of shorthand or a way to capture an, an aesthetic or a feeling that I want to get into the story. Excuse me, but I don't mind if they fall out. And as I said with Fly Away, it's, it's really weird illustrating my own work unless I develop it from the beginning as words and pictures. Mm -hmm. And then often the challenge becomes, how can I put fewer and fewer words in this? And then it eventually becomes just pictures. So the comics, were, were I was directly asked if I would do a comic. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, Gavin and Kelly, the editors, were... <laughs> The writers of Small Beer Press, at, who at the time of the first one were the only publisher I'd really worked a lot with. So they said, have you ever done a comic before? And I said, you know I haven't because everything I have done, I've done for you. <laughs> They're like, would you like to try one? And I said, well, I suppose we, neither of us know what we're getting, but let's, why not? <laughs> so I learned a lot doing that first one. And the second one was a great chance to loosen up and realize there are things I like and that things that entertain me wildly about the first one, but I have trouble looking directly at it because I can see it was me working out how to do a thing and holding incredibly tightly. And I, a lot of my art trajectory has been learning to loosen up. And perhaps instead of drawing things three times until I get it right, draw things 10 times until I get it wrong in an interesting way that I can control. <laughs> So I was playing a lot more with that, just trying to keep it really loose and sketchy in the second one. I've done short, like I've done a lot of mixed pictures and words. A lot of that's for patrons. So I'm hoping to do something with that eventually. It's really, they don't fit into any particular page format. And I'm working <laughs> towards doing a comic project again at some point in the future. And so it's been quite nice going, okay, what do I like doing? picking up comics I just raided a bookstore this afternoon for a whole lot of YA and middle grade comics and some picture books what do I personally look at and go I'm enjoying the story and what do I look at and go oh I want to do that oh mm -hmm. I didn't know you could do that with color I want to play with watercolor so uh, yeah it's just I think different questions to answer with the if I'm going to write in words it's often about the texture of the words they're still both quite visual but as I mentioned before with Fly Away as well, I love, I love painterly work. I love what can be done with colours and textures and oils and all that. And I don't do that in my art. And writing is a chance to do mm -hmm. neat things with light and be photo real or do different sorts of surreal effects that I can't do on the page with the drawing. <laughs> Did that answer all the question or just part of it? <laughs> Um, almost all of it. And the one that it didn't uh, answer, I didn't actually ask yet, <laughs> uh, which is whether you see illustrations for other writers as a kind of narrative as well. Yes, definitely. To varying extents, but it's either a narrative of what's happening in my head mm -hmm. while I'm telling it, <laughs> or a narrative of a particular way I wanted to address a challenge or occasionally a slightly parallel but not identical story that might be happening I love it when I can get in little little things that amuse me a little jokes a hint of something someone in distress in the background of the main characters hijinks or whatever so I do I do enjoy all that and it's also if it's a picture of just one image then how much story can you tell with just one image and that's why I like doing the book covers that I've done for short story collections I find really interesting because personal challenges, if they'll let me get away with it, which they won't always, try and work out a design that has some sort of a nod to every story in the collection. And it, ple it, it pleases me doing that. If someone presented me with a book that had that on the cover and said, see if you can pick out every story in the cover, I'd go, no, I don't solve puzzles. Other people solve <laughs> puzzles. But I love putting them together. <laughs> And I suppose the only thing that doesn't really cover is travelogues, which mm. to me is a picture book. Oh, sorry, it's not a picture book, it's a sketchbook. Mm. And is me going through much. Travelogues is a lot like the early stages of working through someone else's book, because I was just literally going from one end to the other of a train journey. 
and taking notes of the things I saw along the way, which could be interesting, which I didn't want to forget. And then going back and like, oh, there's a sort of a story here if you string them all together. 